going back to work was really difficult in a sense of I just wanted to be at home. I felt bad for leaving Joe and Yara at home, leaving Joe to kind of manage Yara all by herself. And I say that, Joe does a fantastic job, but it's just the fact that babies are a lot of work. Then they're, they're not easy. They need, you know, especially that is they need constant attention, they need constant supervision. And so going to work was very, very difficult. We're very blessed in a sense that we have families who can uh, plan to help and support us when Joe goes back to work. So Joe's parents would so even now, so Joe's parents tend to come down like once a week during the week just to give just to give Joe a bit, a bit of a break sometime. And we're back. Welcome to the Parenting Truths podcast. Today, I'm joined by co-creator of the interracial space and dad to a seven and six and a half month old, um, Ken Koyama. Thanks for joining me, Ken. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to kind of, you know, viewing your content and kind of now joining you on here. So it's quite a nice experience to be. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fairly new podcast, but the idea is just to chat openly and honestly to parents to hopefully bring some validation to other parents to know, let them know that they're not alone in their struggles. Because mm. <laughs> parenting, yeah, parenting is... Yeah, it is different. I don't think there's anything that can prepare you for it. You can do all the prep on whatever you want prior to baby arriving, but when baby is here it's just a different different ball game it's just something you have to experience and then just live it almost yeah so there's there's a couple of um things i wanted to chat about today but first should we kick off by maybe going back to before you became a parent and sort of where were you in your life when you and your partner were like right now's the time we're going to start hopefully to have a family yeah so prior so prior to becoming parents so Oh, so we've had quite a lot of change in the last sort of two years. So we were living in Southampton because my wife was doing her clinical psychology doctorate. And we always kind of knew that. So we've been together 11 years. I We've kind of moved around because of, either I've been studying at university or Joe was studying at university or to get onto a clinical psychology course, which is quite hard. You have to get a lot of different experiences. So we moved around quite a lot. And we always knew that once Joe had got onto the course and was kind of finishing the course that, the family was the, the next thing so we always knew that we want to have want to have a family so it was a case of almost both of us getting through our training that we needed to do and then having i guess being in a position where we're kind of financially stable and in a good place to have kids or have a kid if we're, if, if we're fortunate to have kids because it's not easy and a lot of people go through different challenges so the the plan was always yeah let's finish our courses joe joe's course was kind of later because i started i did my master's in physiotherapy 2016 finished in 2018 so it's kind of once they got onto course and then finished that it was a case of yeah have a family and then that that was the the loose plan and so yeah. i think yes yeah, so we got yes yeah, so we got pregnant oh feb i think february jan 2020 yeah, 2020 yeah 2022 obviously and then october yara joined us and has changed everything and has brought us a lot of challenges a lot of joy which has been an interesting interesting journey so far and as a dad, how did you find navigating through the pregnancy? Did you, were you quite involved in the pregnancy or were you quite hands off? How did you navigate through with your, with your partner? I think I'm very fortunate because I, I'm a physio, physiotherapist by background. I specialize in musculoskeletal therapy, yeah. but I've worked on a ward. And so I've got a background kind of medical knowledge and I know how hospitals and wards work. And I remember when we found out we were pregnant, I was like, okay. And it took me probably about three or four days to kind of process the actual initial, oh, we're pregnant. That that moment, that took like three or four days to kind of process it and actually for it to feel real. And then after that, I bought, um, I bought, I, I, bought, I, I read books. Like if I, if I buy a book, I can then go through it. So I think I bought a book by Maria Louise, which is How to Prepare for Pregnancy and Beyond. And I pretty much kind of read through it page page to page. And that was kind of our guide of how to navigate pregnancy. And work was quite flexible. My manager was great, whereas pretty much any appointments I needed to go to, she was happy for me to go to the appointments. So oh, in that sense, yeah, so she was really, really good. Um, she's a mother of two, and she was really flexible. I had control of my own diary, so I had that flexibility to do that. And I think I was very active, one, because I work in healthcare, and two, because reading that book and understanding what changes that women go through, it felt a bit remiss for me to say, okay, you're going to do this. I'm going to kind of stand off because actually they go through so much physically and emotionally they have to deal with. So it, it only made sense for me for, 
it only made sense to me that my part was to then support her. And so my part, my support and I was like, okay, so I'm going to understand what's happening. I'm going to know why these things are happening. I'm going to know what to expect. And then when it comes to the labor part, I know what what's going on. So I think I was very hands on in that regard. And even with the appointments, I would ask questions. I would actively ask questions to make sure things were kind of we knew why why things were happening and what was what was the plan going forward. Luckily, Joe was like a low risk pregnancy, so it was all very smooth. But I was very very I guess intentional going into those appointments, uh, and so I kind of made it known that I was going to play a part in it. I think there were times where I I, I wasn't necessarily always I wasn't necessarily asked questions or kind of addressed during the appointments, but I would when they've all kind of said their things, I would ask questions at the end just to make sure okay these things are boxed off, these things are what we this is what's happening going forward, which I found quite an interesting experience in terms of how the dads can sometimes feel like an afterthought in those appointments or kind of throughout the kind of pregnancy journey. Yeah, I find the more I talk to dads as well, dads are far more practical in sort of the preparations they need to make. I I remember the parking at the at their local hospital is awful so one of my main concerns was during the labor like where do i park so i i was asking people tips around that and it was like right you've got mm. to write a note you've got you've got to leave it in your car window so if you do need to literally drive to the door you know that's that's absolutely fine but i find that dads are a lot more concerned um about those practicality uh, th- th- those practical issues yeah the logistics yeah <laughs> yeah definitely we did that so i think two weeks before joe gave birth we actually drove to our local hospital and found we went and parked in the hospital and we went and found the ward because the last thing i wanted was for joe okay to be, yeah oh yeah because yeah the last thing we wanted for joe to be in loads of pain and for us trying to find the ward so we went and found the ward maybe two three weeks before joe was due so that when it did happen part of the car knew exactly where we were going knew how to get to the ward and that was that was that and that was just a case of I guess trying to manage the situation and do as much as I can because you are I don't know how you felt but I felt you are quite helpless in that situation you're almost like a bystander so I felt knowing kind of how everything's set up made me feel okay I've got a bit of control I can kind of help support and influence the situation a bit more yeah literally everything's out of your control so any any sort of thing you can rationalize or you can get a plan of action in place although sometimes during the birth it will go completely out of the window yeah it's nice it's nice mentally just to get yourself in the right head headspace for when you know either the waters break or labor starts and you do need to act quickly even you know getting getting the pregnancy bags ready um i try i try to let let dads know that you know you it's important for dads to have a bag too because you could be in there for a long time so you want to be fresh and yeah you could be there a while <laughs> so yeah and i mean all of that so getting involved at that stage i think helps massively for when although nothing can prepare you for when the baby comes it just allows you to be that much more involved doesn't it and then make that transition when when baby arrives yeah definitely i think you're right it definitely helps you from a I guess, practical standpoint. But what I don't think the lot, I guess that logical and kind of logistic point of view of thinking of how to support doesn't, I don't think that prepares you for the mass, the massive emotional shift and challenge that comes with then dealing with all those things. Because obviously, you know, again, Joe was low risk pregnancy throughout. So that's great. But those people who have things like preeclampsia or have gest- gestational diabetes, all those things, then how do you then support your partner or your wife in those situations i don't think it gives you that you know i don't think it, it gives you the emotional tools to navigate those situations which are very very difficult and it's very you know it's, you can't say you can't prepare for it but i think i think it can be quite isolating as as a dad to get that emotional support in terms of dealing with the expectations and pressures that come with being a parent or how to be a good partner kind of during the labor process and afterwards i think you know, the logistics are great, but I don't think it necessarily pre- prepares you for the, the emotional challenges that come along with it afterwards. Yeah, it's, it's why I'm quite vocal on the dad vibe. So Laura and I, well, Laura's been pre- pregnant seven times. We've got two healthy little ones. We've had four first trimester losses. And we had also had a daughter that, that was born when she was five months pregnant, which is obviously really hard because it was... Mm. We went. We went to the twenty-week scan. So the five-month scan told her heart. Had, we're told her heart had stopped. But then Laura still had to go through giving birth. We had, you know, we spent some time with the with baby Noah. And then 
Laura's body still thought thought that she was pregnant. So then she still had to go through all of the aftermath as she would, yeah, you know, a full term baby. So I, I try to be quite um, respectful when I share information about that because mm. um, I know it can be quite triggering for a lot of people. But there are so many. It, it's such a scary time, and you know a traumatic time for so many people that a lot of things can go wrong during your yeah. journey to try and start a family. So even just bringing yeah. awareness to some of this sort of things can help dads better prepare. Cause I've had both mothers and fathers reach out to me that have received, you know, awful news at the, whether it's a 12 week scan or the 20 week scan. And they've said the fact that they read my sort of account of what happened sort of helped them rationalize what happened and know that it can be okay. But it's, it's such, it can be the best thing in the world, the most magical thing in the world, but also the most traumatic. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. And I think, I guess I want to ask, I imagine, and uh, I could be assuming it, obviously did the Lord get quite a lot of support in terms of, I guess, emotionally kind of post kind of going through these these events, or was it a case of you had to kind of sort it yourselves? Um, so it's a bit of a weird one because on the NHS, unless, you have three miscarriages consecutively, um, you don't get that extra support. So you could have two miscarriages back to back. Uh, you have a healthy baby. You could have another two. So you've at that point, you've had four miscarriages, but you still don't get that support. But I think when ba- baby Noah was born, because she was um, a perfectly healthy baby, we had all the tests. No one knows why her heart stopped. It was just one of those freak things. Um, Laura was given a lot of support. So we went privately with a, a doctor called uh, Dr. Brian Beatty, who did some investigation and gave us a plan of action, which was nice. Um, because after Noah was born, we then got pregnant twice more and had early miscarriages those times. So we were like, right, we probably need to pause here and, and investigate what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. And then from that point the nhs were very invested and laura was scanned pretty much every week for nine months which you can imagine i remember those early scans yeah yeah i can only imagine how tough it was yeah you'd assume everything's uh, has gone wrong at each and every scan it got a little bit easier towards the tail end of the pregnancy but as soon as you've had the scan and, and you see the heartbeat and you know the baby's fine from that point, you leave the hospital, but we just assume that something could have gone wrong since the scan, and then you start worrying. Um, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I'd say probably the, we've got a, a six-month-old now, baby Mia, who was born over Christmas, and I'd say the journey through her pregnancy was very traumatic because of, obviously, what we've what we've gone through, but the NHS were unbelievable. We had very consistent care, so we went to the same hospital every week we had the same consultant the same midwives were working on the days that we went in so they basically followed us through um and i think that consistent level of care the way the nhs is structured isn't always possible for people in pregnancy but when you receive it it's it's unbelievable Mm. it makes massive difference yeah i guess i think if from from an emotional point of view did you feel like you had much support in terms of mostly you got you guys are both going through it as well, but I, I there's a lot of focus on the mothers. Completely understandable because you know they're the ones who physically have to do all this. But I guess from from an emotional point of view, did you find a you had any I guess support or an outlet or there was every kind of any conversations about how you're feeling or how you're managing that side of things as well? No, not really. But I think I, I wouldn't say Laura received much. Um, she had to go out and and seek the support when Noah was born. We we got a pack uh, and a leaflet and um, that was basically it. There was no one following up with Laura to check she was okay, like they would with a yeah. someone who has given birth to a full-term baby. So no, I, I wouldn't say there was much for dads, but there wasn't even... Um, much for Laura from the sounds of things. No, a, a counsellor even in our trust for Laura to speak to. So she had to go via a friend who's a midwife mm-hmm. to go via someone else. Um, and she was able to get to get that level of support. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, no, I think it's interesting how, the yeah, I'm not getting to the, I guess, the, the minutiae of the NHS, but how different trusts can provide different levels of support. But it's just interesting how much, you know, 
people can or cannot get depending on where they're based in the country, which is a different I know. conversation, a different topic. We could go down that rabbit hole f- for a very long period of time, but yeah. Yeah, I think the yeah the NHS is is brilliant in terms of the individuals and you know the effort that the the nurses and the midwives put in, but in terms of the overarching structure of the NHS, it's just things are missing in terms yeah. of the way <laughs> things communicate. Um, you know, when um, Noah died, Laura received a letter for the um, for another scan for, for for Noah, and obviously that was quite triggering wow. for Laura at the time. Um, understandably yeah but, but you can understand that it's just because the different departments aren't communicating and that happens a lot i've spoken to a lot mm, of, it's not seamless always. yeah so yeah there's a lot of improvements to be made but obviously they do a lot of good and they provide a lot of support as well it's just a, a tough one isn't it mm, yeah no i mean i've got a bit of a bias because i work with the nhs but i completely appreciate yeah in terms of like, the overall what, people, what the individuals do they do amazing work but if you look at the tools that they're given to do that work with unfortunately there's going to be cracks cracks that appear and that's a long conversation a lot of things could be discussed about but yeah no it's definitely a a challenging one for sure yeah so flipping back to your own um journey so obviously you've journeyed through the pregnancy your little one was born how did um what did paternity leave look like for you so paternity for leave for me was two weeks which okay is you know i guess standard within a uk which isn't great in terms of if you compare it to other countries as well because I, I, when i was a potential i thought i'd look into it and compared to other countries you, two weeks is nothing you know i think nationwide bank literally on that west have just started, started doing a year paternity leave for dads which is relatively new um oh wow but i know that i think it's japan you get six months germany you get up to six months as well so two weeks is yeah, nothing because the first few weeks you're pretty much just trying to figure out what's going on. You know, the, the ROs they're not really into their stride of things. They're still quite sleepy from kind of after birth or from all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's two weeks flowing by, and also you have a lot of kind of um, you have a lot of visitors as well, so kind of midwife and stuff who come through. So you've got all those appointments, and so the two weeks kind of just flew by in the sense that if we weren't sleeping and we weren't really we was probably with you trying to kind of manage you and sort her out we were quite um what's what i'm looking for we were, we were quite structured in what we wanted in terms of visitors we were kind of saying look we just want these two weeks to kind of settle in and they didn't have loads of visitors coming straight away which i think for some family members was a bit more challenging than others i think obviously i understand if they want to come and visit the baby all that stuff but i think for both joe and i and from a physical and an emotional point of view just to have those two weeks to just settle in and find our feet and adapt to what was going on then that was really important for us and i think that's something that's something we communicated and decided you know before yara arrived we kind of said yeah when she's here hopefully everything's gone smooth we're, we're going to be you know basically you know, not ev- everyone can't come around straight away you can let me know i'll let you know when's a good time to come around and you can only stay for a short period of time and that was kind of that conversation and so that, that's what worked well for us and i think going back to work after the paternity leave was horrible <laughs> i yeah honestly the guilt was uh yeah and even now i still feel guilty when i go to work now and this is seven months down the line so yeah so going back to work was really difficult in a sense of i just wanted to be at home I felt bad for leaving Joe and Yara at home, leaving Joe to kind of manage Yara all by herself. And I say that Joe does a fantastic job, but it's just the fact that babies are a lot of work. Then they're, they're not easy. They need, you know, especially that is any constant attention, any constant supervision. And it's, so going to work was very, very difficult. We're very blessed in a sense that we have our families can are planning to help and support us when Joe goes back to work. So Joe's parents would. So even now, so Joe's parents tend to come down like once a week during the week just to give just to give Joe a bit, of, a bit of a break sometimes and and help out as well around the house. And you know, I think when I went back to work the first week, I was like, Joe's like, I'll be fine, kid. I can do it on my own. I, like, I know you can do it on your own, but I don't want you to be alone for that first. Because I think I worked from home Monday, worked from home Monday, worked from home Tuesday morning. I'm in clinic in the afternoon, and I worked from home all day Thursday. So I think Wednesday was the first day where I was going to be out for like a whole ten hours. And I said, to her, I know you can do it by yourself, but I don't want you to do it by yourself. I think it was more for me that I didn't want to be on her own rather than for herself because I think it took away that guilt of actually she's got that support when I'm when I'm at work just in case. You know, she didn't necessarily need it. I work 10 minutes away and she can always call me. But it felt good for me to, for her to have that support that it's there just in case because it can be incredibly isolating 
on your own with a baby that potentially could be crying loads or you're not sure what's going on. So when you look at what mums have to deal with, it has the potential to be very, very isolating. It has the potential to be very difficult physically and emotionally. And so for me, I think how I navigated it and my guilt was actually, can you make sure your parents are coming around when I'm not when I'm not here just so I felt a bit better? Obviously, as I was got older, Joe, you know, as I was got older, she's doing a, parents aren't always around as much. It's a bit more selective on depending on what's going on. But for yeah, that going back to work felt horrible. I still struggle with it now. Uh, and I don't think it's just like it's gonna get easier. I don't think it, Cause I, you know, I don't know about you, but I just want to be around and be and be a good dad and be as involved as possible. Because these moments, they just go, and you know, nothing's nothing's guaranteed. Yeah, they're very short lived, and I think we're your little one sounds like they're a month older than than Mia, and they change so much, so so quickly, don't they? And I think paternity leave for dads should really, obviously, the the, the longer the better. But I think it's non existent in in the US. In the UK, it varies. It varies massively. But if it was to come in two bursts, because like you say, in that, well, in the whole of the fourth trimester, so the first three months, it's very much going through the motions, responding to the baby's needs around the clock 24-7. It's only really when they start, you know, engaging with you, tracking you around the room, giggling, laughing, can you really start to get that that back and forth feedback from them and that's when Mm -hmm. the fun starts really doesn't it and it's a shame that that dads are back in work by that point on the whole yeah yeah for sure yeah you're definitely right the first yeah that when they sort of do stuff is oh actually i can kind of see who you are now you kind of get that personality and you get a feedback and actually i'm very blessed that i work from home so in between like patients and stuff all my admins i've got a bit of time i'll go upstairs or we'll bring you announcers we'll hang out and play around whatever but i I had the luxury to do that some people have to be at work they have to physically be away which i i find difficult and so yeah i agree it's even obviously longer potentially would be great but if or some sort of it altered where you can have a bit more time later on when they're a bit when they're home later when you're home later on kind of throughout the year because the, the demands change as well, and you know, in terms of what they might need from a support and an and, uh, engagement point of view, changes massively. So you're at two weeks and her now is a completely different human being. I remember probably about, two, probably about three weeks ago, she was, yeah, she, she's was she been sitting up for ages, probably about since four months. But then all of a sudden she just started like reaching for things. I was like, where has this come from? Because there was no sign of her reaching at all. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, she can grab things. It's like, oh, okay, that that's new and it's you know you miss out you miss all those moments <laughs> it changes the game doesn't it when you can't yeah yeah <laughs> you can't just sit, leave on the floor and then like, okay no I know. I'm, I'm dreading crawling by the way absolutely dreading that that period of time oh my goodness yeah not looking forward to that yeah that's, that's just gonna be a whole different have you started baby proofing the house yet or have you started looking around th- thinking for danger zones or yeah yeah it's it's I'd say Joe's far more on than I am. I'm a lot more relaxed. I'm like, ah, we'll be, we'll be fine. But yeah, there's, we've moved the, the furniture around. There's definitely things we know we need to kind of change around. But yeah, I think it's getting to a point where it's going to have to be sooner rather than later because she's trying to crawl now. It's, it's She's fit. She's yeah. intentionally trying to crawl. So it's going to be a case of baby proofing and looking at what needs to be moved around and stair gates and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, that that's the next chapter. And I think with parenting, it's always there's always something else. There's never, a, there's never a constant. Like it's like you get used to one, you get used to one behavior or one skill set, and then something else has cropped up, and they got to manage that as well. And that's the, that's where we are at this moment in time. So it's crawling, which is the, the new fun challenge. Which I'm, yeah. Once she starts crawling, that's it. No, that's it. The stress level's a lot higher all of a sudden. It's the, it's the little routines you get into as well. As a parent, you sort of settle in and really enjoy the little routines, whether it's, you know, bringing the baby down early in the morning and having a coffee or when they're eating, having breakfast with them. But now our oldest is five. And over the years, we've had some amazing little routines, whether it was when he was a toddler going out for walks super early in the mornings, because in the toddler years, all they want to do is just be with you and Mm. essentially do what you're doing, whether you're doing the recycling or cooking. And as long as you keep it safe, it's it's such a fun age, the toddler years. Um, But now at five years old, you know, Luca's in school, he's an independent little boy, he can read and write, and it's just a completely different game. It just changes. I'd say every 
couple of, so so your little one will be crawling but then before you know it they'll be toddling around they'll be walking then you'll be uh transitioning to the potty it's just, yeah. just so short lived there's always something around the corner i think that's what i realized the other, i think we were sitting i think we were sitting in bed the other day and i was thinking parenting is there's, there's always something around the corner you don't know what it is but there's always something you get used to something and then it changes so speaking of routine so what we what would usually happen especially on a weekend is that I so Yara would wake up about six, seven ish, generally speaking. And normally I'd take her downstairs into the front room. She'd sit on her play mat on her little gym and I'd do like a home workout while I get some more sleep because obviously I'm up early during the week. So it's like it's quite a nice time to just get a bit of a lay in whilst I'm around. And before I, I could, you could leave her there, she'd be completely fine. But now she's at this now she's at this age where she want, when she sees you doing stuff, she wants to join you. It's kind of I'm not sure if she's kind of going through that separation anxiety, but she wants you to pick her up and hold her and things. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're, that's what we're managing now. So it's a case of even this afternoon, me and Joe are trying to do a workout, which must be picked up. So it turns out we, we put the weights down. Now she's now the new dumbbell. And she loves it because she's, she's involved. But it's that case of trying to just incorporate her into what we're doing. But yeah, it changes so, so much. And it's that constant, you know, looking around the corner, what's next and adapting to it, which I think, like I said, you, you can prepare for parenting but until you're really in it you just don't know what it's going to be like you don't know how you're going to deal with it and it just it changes you completely you know physically emotionally completely changes you i find i start crying at videos now for no reason I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm so much more emotional now than i've ever been before in my life i watched a video on instagram probably like last week and i just started tearing up it's about this little it's about this little boy who's having um treatment i started crying i couldn't believe it. i was like what well, I, I knew why i'm crying but i was like these emotions were weren't there beforehand but now it's the case of there's so much more to the surface it does change everything about you yeah absolutely so in terms of the the parent because you seem very consciously aware of sort of the way you want to parent you said you're into reading books about everything even during the pregnancy you seem to like to absorb as much knowledge as you can Mm. to sort of ease the journey are you the type of dad you thought you were going to be or did you not really have any expectations on the way you were gonna you were going to parent i think it's changed a lot so i think i had an idea of kind of i had an idea of what parent i'd like to be in terms of pretty fun pretty chilled out but there's certain things that i'd say are always going to hold importance and kind of be very boundaried about and kind of um and uh and be very um set with but then having become a parent and having read a bit more as well and kind of looked at different theories, I think that's definitely changed. So I read the book called by a psychotherapist. It's called, uh, what's it called? It's called the book that you, the book you wish your parents had read and the ones you're, the ones okay. you're kind of glad you've read. And they, and, talk, and literally it kind of just changes my perspective on kind of being a parent and understanding kind of where the, the child's coming from almost, because I think you can have that kind of authority, authority, authoritarian led kind of parenting or kind of responsive parenting and i wouldn't say i think before and i was like okay now we're going to do this this and this and be a bit more structured but actually since you i've been here i'm like well you know what and also my wife's a clinical psychologist and, and this is the thing where it's like because the point is it's at that point well her behaviors are the behavior her behaviors are you know what's the, what's the function behind the behavior so if someone's doing this you know, for example, so if Yara is on the floor sitting down and she sees you doing something, she starts crying, starts, so she starts putting her hands up and starts doing this with her palms. If she's doing that, what that means is she wants you to pick her up. And so it's a case of, okay, the reason she's doing something because there's a need behind that behaviour. And so I'm a lot more chilled out or I'm a lot less structured than I thought I'd be. Uh, and I think I'm a lot more just responsive. Actually, you know what, this is what she wants to do, which go along with it. And that's kind of it, really. I think in terms of things such as like sleeping so in my mind kind of I was like yeah we'll get it down to routine she have a routine she'll go in a cot all that sort of stuff I haven't done any of that we're co-sleeping because actually she responds to it she likes it she settled when we do it and it's like well this is what she wants to do we'll, we'll just do it and actually it, work, it works for all three of us you know it, it rather than battling and fighting and trying to enforce this behavior on her that we want we're going, we're going along with what she wants to do and actually if she's sleeping better and she feels more comfort and feels safe why why argue with it because actually there's a reason why she wants that and i think yeah with regards to sleep specifically i think there's this pressure to say oh baby has to be sleeping by themselves by x by x amount but it's like well who made these rules up where are these 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 
definitive structures coming from. And I think Joe's helped me massively and become a lot more flexible and recognising that actually there's no need to put these these goalposts or these things down. It's a case of actually just go what work, do what works for you and actually just be flexible with it. So I think that's kind of, that's the biggest change I've noticed in myself is that I'm a lot more flexible and a lot more kind of baby led than I thought I would be. As you get as you get older, it be it will see if you're, I, I have the same amount of patience. There's obviously <laughs> there are a lot more different challenges, but I like to think so because I think you know there's always it's trying to understand the behaviour because no one yeah you know and you've obviously been through the toddler phase and you know and now is uh, Luca isn't he? he's a he's a young boy now isn't he and so you've had to he's deal five, with that yeah. yeah five years old so and I think you know you've had to deal with those challenges and I like to think that when she's you know, two years old or when she's three, all those things, I have the patience to recognise, okay, rather than thinking about what I want, okay, what's she trying to tell me and try to respond to it in, in that sense as well. That, that's the hope, I, I, that's, that's my hope for myself. Whether it turns out that way, we'll see, but that's definitely the the intention for me going forward. Yeah, I think what you've described is rings true for all, for, for the entirety of your parenting journey, because once you do lay those goalposts down and set expectations based on what you expect or need that's when all the frustration and the the anger starts creeping in you know because the baby's just not just not sleeping in their own bed like they should but like you say if you just add that level of flexibility if co-sleeping is working for you and everyone's on board with it then great you know we co-slept with Luca for four and a half years and he's as independent as as the next child at school you know he runs into school in the morning happily um but yeah it I think the toddler years are, are the number one sort of age that parents do struggle with because those expectations are really misaligned. But I think if you do what you say, like appreciate that there probably is something going on behind the behavior, looking at it through that lens makes parenting much less stressful. Um, I know different parents enjoy different ages. I personally love the toddler years. Yeah. You know, it's super frustrating when you're in a shop and they're rolling around on the floor because you've said no to the magazine. That is awful. But <laughs> if you look at it through well, that's their... that's just life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If you yeah. look, if you see them in that moment as naughty and annoying, then you're going to get stressed. You're going to start shouting. It's just going to, it's just going to basically derail the day and make it an awful experience for everyone. But when you actually see it as, you know, it's it's a two-year-old, they really want a magazine. Of course they want a magazine, but as the parent, we can't keep buying a magazine. Unfortunately, we've got to say no, but you know, they're still learning how to regulate the fact that you said no to them and that's absolutely fine. doesn't mean you give them the magazine, but you can be that much more responsive in that moment. And I think, that's the thing. I think you mentioned that two things that I think is that one, I think is expectation. And then I think there's this pressure from the outside world that, oh, you know, you have to do this, this and this. And it's, and I think from what kind of our point of view, and I'm speaking for Joe here a little bit, it's a case of, well, we're going to do what works for us because, you know, we've made our own decision. We've written, you know, we've looked at the pros and, the pros and cons. This works for us. This is what we're going to do. If people don't like that, that's kind of their problem or that's just something for them to deal with. But I think, you know, it is finding that balance of actually what works for you as a family. Yes, you are going to have to set boundaries at a certain point, And yes, they're not necessarily going to, have to understand that. But it's setting that sort of, it's setting the, I guess, the the patterns of behaviour in place. So actually when, so if, you know, by being responsive now, when she is a bit older, we can then continue to be responsive. It's probably going to be frustrating for, for, for us and for her at times, but it's, it's that whole thing of actually in the grand scheme of things, it's, they've been around, they've been alive for two years or they've been alive for six months you know it's a case of well they've only been around for this long why are we expecting so in our case why might you know why are we expecting for example yara at seven months to be completely independent x with x y and z and ultimately it's like well they've been around for like 70 days like come on now you know where where do where do these expectations really come from and, and why and why do we why do we feel this pressure to, to to meet these expectations when actually are they really realistic based off just general human experiences and lifestyles? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you've got it all to come, mate. So Luca was um, <laughs> two just as we went into lockdown. So I was obviously not lucky because of COVID, but fortunate to be home with him 
pretty much every day through the toddler years and it's there's so much fun to be had the games you can play and stuff and it's when when they really start gaining that independence and that personality and it's it's really cool but every phase has got um some positives it's just yeah and challenges of course yeah I think that's just life, though, isn't it? When you think about it, life or yeah. parenting, there's always positive. There's always something you got to chat. There's, there's always going to be nothing's perfect, but it's looking at what's the you know taking the the good that comes with it and actually just embracing it. So, I'm loving Yara's moment. Huh? I'm looking forward to her being a bit older so we can do a bit more together. But in the same token, I don't, I don't want to wish away this time because I'm like mm, it's so finite and actually you're only going to be you know this big for this long. You're going to want cuddles for this long. You know before you know it, you're going to be doing your own thing and not want to hang out with me anymore. Like my niece is 11 years old. It's like, oh, how? And we, we're really close when we get on, you know, and when I go around and we muck around and stuff, it's like, how long before actually she's too cool for her uncle? It's like, you know, these these moments really, really go by quickly. And so, yeah, it's like, like anything, there's challenges, but it's also the, 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 the joys that come with it as well and the joys of parenting. Yeah. Yeah, I think also you're quite eager to rush things with your first as well. I remember with Luca... Just like, you know, I bought him a bike with pedals way earlier than I should have. I remember for his first birthday, I got him a, a Ford Focus remote control car that I could um, control and drive him around. He just kept falling in the footwell. And yeah. <laughs> my wife was like, Tom, just calm down. He's, he's one. Let's just take our time. All the, all the fun stuff will, will come with time. So I had to just rein it back. But yeah, it does get fun. <laughs> Cool. Well, what I want to do with all of my guests to close out, I mean, there's so much we could speak about today. So, I mean, it goes without saying, we definitely need to get you back on to cover um, a whole host of other questions. Um, but I'm just asking guests a couple of quick fire questions to close out, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, cool. So, let me get them up. So, Question one is, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself before you became a parent? I think the advice I'd give to myself before I became a parent would be take that, like, just embrace it all and take your time. There's, there's, there's no rush. Just yeah, be present because it does go so quickly. And that would be the, the big thing I'd say because I look at pictures from you and she was like, two months old and look at it now i'm like where's that time gone so i think be present be present take your time and take loads of pictures yeah absolutely um question two what's the one thing you feel you need to work on personally as a parent uh, i think no no I, I still think being patient is my thing I, and although i think i'm pretty good generally speaking i just don't like i Sometimes I, I had, so Joe, Joe have VR all day. I'm like, I don't know how you do it all day. You know, it's, it's really, really challenging. And I, I'll catch myself, I get frustrated. And I know I'm frustrated. I, I, I don't let, I don't take it out on you, but it's like, just try and just be a bit more patient and just take a breath because I don't get angry or anything, but I'm just like, oh, this is tough. And I think it's just being more patient with it and just recognizing that it's going to be tough and going to be challenging. And that's just, how it is and you'll get you'll get through that afterwards and you'll yeah you know the, that frustration will pass quite quickly so i think it's just being patient and being you know being kind to yourself probably and it, it you know the baby days can be frustrating can't they because you don't get a lot back and obviously you know the baby cries quite often and you, you might have something in your head that head that you need to get done i've got i've got a list yeah as long as my arm of things that need to get done right in the house but when you're i'm holding mia you know I, I can barely do anything so i try and throw her in the baby in the baby carrier as much as i can but then i'm still quite limited um but yeah it's um i think that's something all parents need to work on isn't it and you know 